Now, this is promising to be an exciting conversation we will have. But first, let's go to the streets uh, to check, of course, uh, what uh, the youth are saying on whether uh, our youth, Nigerian youths, are losing uh, or losing it or losing out. Well, um, our correspondent, uh, Ekene Njulue, went out to find out what uh, they think about this topic. I think one of the factors that leads to high crime rates is generally unemployment. Even for somebody to get a work after university, he must have to be connected with either a farm sec or a minister, which in those days is not like that. There's also a problem of uh, value system. The value system has been corrupted, and um, there's a lot of desperation to make money. And uh, you cannot uh, blame them because the system has gone bad the kind of value attached to wealth, money, is so high that everybody runs around looking for it, regardless of how he gets the money. Youths are complaining, no job. Um, they are afflating that to the increase in crime rate. But, I mean, we should get ourselves busy. Agriculture is a business now. I mean, not just an activity. So the youth should be encouraged to go into agriculture. I think another area is uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, education. When uh, the youth are educated properly, I think they will get uh, uh, something doing by engaging in, in so many things. I remember when, when I was a looper, well, I didn't have to bribe anybody. I don't need to know anybody. And I walk, I walk in, they asked me to apply, I was interviewed and I got the job. But today it's not like that. Number one is whom you know. There are people who are better than those who are working, just because they are not connected. And they say until the, the, the child of nobody is given their right, there won't be peace. What I should do now is to really open up so many opportunities for the youth to see reasons for them to be in Nigeria. Employment is one, you know. Like, most people are do skill accusations. They are there. When you encourage them, genuinely, Nigeria will be a better place. All right, now that was um, a cross-section of uh, Nigerians there uh, speaking to our correspondent on what they think about uh, the status and state of some Nigerian youth today. We have guests with us in the studios now to uh, discuss uh, other ramifications of the subject matter. Let's welcome the uh, former Honorable Minister of Youth and Sports, uh, Mr. Solomon Dalong. Uh, pleasure to have you with us on Good Morning Nigeria. Uh, good morning, Nigeria. Also here with us in the studios, Engineer Mohammed Onoto. He's founder of Productive Youth Network and Read to Rise Nigeria uh, Limited, and author of uh, Future Starts Today and What I Will Do If unemployed. Onoto, delighted to have you this morning. Good morning. I certainly would like to learn more about that, that last part, what I will do if unemployed. Uh, uh, thank God we have Engineer Onoto here with us. Uh, but also here with us uh, is a youth who is also doing some amazing things, uh, politics-wise and, of course, uh, in other aspects. Ndi Kato is the Executive Director, Dini Dari Foundation. Uh, it's a long time we've had her here. Izzy, thank you very much for joining us on thank this you conversation. Thank you for having me. And uh, Victor Lapang, Commissioner for Youth and Sports Development, Plateau State, joins us from our JOS studio. We'd like to appreciate your presence with us. Hello. All right. Uh, we hope we'll hear him uh, when we return to him for his response to our first set of questions. W once again, uh, it's our pleasure to have all, all our guests uh, with us. Uh, but we are kicking off and uh, stating that we are not making any sweeping statement. Uh, there is no generalization that all Nigerian youth are necessarily uh, into negative things. There are heartwarming stories of hard-working young Nigerians, boys and girls, men uh, and women who are in the youth category, and they are recording achievements in aspects of agriculture, in the entertainment industry, in education, 
and elsewhere. But I'm sure that all Nigerians are aware of the plenitude of stories that we have been confronted with in recent times. When we hear of kidnapping, when we hear of banditry, when we hear of Yahoo Yahoo boys, armed robbery, and so on and so forth, when you look at the age uh, groups of these persons, they obviously fall uh, within the youth. Uh, the uh, craze for money and instant wealth uh, is such that uh, people are asking themselves, uh, is this the way to go? Uh, let's begin with the uh, former Minister of, of, of Youth and Sports. Are we having a crisis with uh, our youth development? Of course, the answer is obvious. We are having a very huge crisis with um, youth development. And um, a reflection of this crisis is when you interrogate, I mean, all the challenges the country is confronting, whether you take insecurity, you go to economy, you go to <coughs> uh, the social component of the society, you discover that the active population engaged in all this falls within the youth bracket. So we cannot um, deny the fact that we have crisis in our hands. And I believe that this crisis may not be far-fetched from the, the, the nature of investment Nigeria as a country has put in that particular uh, sector. Because you don't go to reap where you do not uh, sow. Youth development is an integral component of national development. In fact, it is foundational. So if you are talking about leadership, good leadership, you have to invest more in youth development to produce good leadership. If you, are to, if you aspire to be a, a, a technologically advanced country, you prepare the youth demography for that. So when the investment is not commensurate to your expectation as a country, then definitely you have to deal with this crisis as the population continues to surge. So basically, this is where we are. And I take myself as an example, growing as a young man. I mean, the, the, what I met on the ground was that the country invested in me. I mean, right from the home, I was brought up to believe in this country. I had hope. And as young as I was, I believed I was going to be a leader. This was not a mere dream. It was something that was factor in the orientation. The school system, when I was going to primary school, they, 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 they would bribe me with this uh, crystal milk before I go to school. So we were rushing to school every day because it was distributed there. And when we get to school, almost everything was there. I, I sat on the ground in primary school, in primary one. So I was using the, the ground to learn how to write. But right from primary two, I had a desk to myself. And in primary three, I had a, a fountain pen with an ink. All this provided by the school. So that investment, of course, created the hope and confidence in me and uh, how I look up to what I will be and what contribution I will make in the society. Um, I, 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 I don't know. If you listen to the, uh, some of the responses, uh, uh, Mr. Nalong, you, you, you discover that they have put the issue squarely at the foot of institutions, institutional gap. They, they seem to say, look, there is an institutional gap between you know, them and the youth. So what's, what's your response to that? Of course, obvious, obviously, I, I, I hold a very critical opinion about 
the issue of the institutional gap. And um, I sometimes blame uh, our generation and the generation ahead for maybe a, a, a deliberate or a conspiracy theory of this neglect. Because I find myself unable to explain why that gap will exist in the first place. This is because if you look at what, if you listen to what the youths are saying, these institutional gaps occasion as a result of the collapse of our institution themselves. One of the young persons said, well, the best of the young people are outside. And, and, and those who are incompetent are the ones to engage. So, of course, you know what you will ultimately get. But the point here is, why must a young man bribe his way before he is employed? What has happened suddenly to interviews <coughs> of employment into the Federal Civil Service that takes place yearly, where people are invited, panels are constituted, they are screened, they go for aptitude tests, they go for a series of examinations before they are employed. What has happened to background check, checking of those that are employed? I signed Shochi for a young man to be employed in one of the security services. And with my limited knowledge, I, I thought he was okay. But when he went for training, a background check was conducted. A panel was sent to his village. The panel went and met local people farming and started asking questions about the young man at the village. They said, oh. He was a very dangerous person. I mean, he set his father's house ablaze. So the parent was able to extract information about the type of person. And immediately they got back. He was kicked out. And they got back to me. Why did you have to sign this guarantee? I mean, it took the grace of God and maybe my own integrity to, for me to escape. So if the institutions are functional and effective, these gaps will not exist. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Solomon uh, Balong. Let's uh, try to return to Joss uh, and see if uh, the audio with the Plateau State Commissioner for Youth and Sports is okay now. Uh, Victor uh, Lapang. Uh, Victor Lapang, of course, you've listened to the uh, background information as well as the establishing remarks that uh, have been made uh, so far. Uh, straight away, uh, are you concerned about uh, what we see some, if not a good number of our youths uh, do these days and the kind of attitude that they have? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce myself again. I'm Victor Lapang, Commissioner for Youth and Sports Development, Plateau State. And I hope you're hearing me now. Yes, uh, it's quite concerning the uh, problems of the youth, but uh, I don't think it's a new problem because uh, right from time immemorial, every generation has its problems. So uh, with the advent of the internet and all the uh, gadgets that are moving around now, you would expect this kind of problems. Yeah, it's quite worrisome. Uh, I, like uh, about 3,700 years ago, uh, there was what was called the Code of Humorabi, and it, uh, it, 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 it tried to right the, the wrongs, the social uh, problems as, as at that time. So all through times, even uh, recently in the 60s and 70s, there, has been pro there have been problems with uh, youth restiveness, and each generation tries to find ways of mitigating those problems. So it's not a new problem, and... Uh, uh, every, every responsible government needs to find ways of curbing these problems. Okay, let me uh, return to Ndi Kato. He says it's a generational problem, what we're experiencing now. It's, you know, by so, so uh, implying uh, that it's inevitable. I mean, the decadence, moral decadence, the involvement in crimes and criminality, you know, by some youth, it's probably inevitable. So um, I, I would agree with him. I mean, youth, of course, we have the time, we have the energy, and um, 
you know, but, but let's also look at our own time. During your time, it would have been there, yes. But at this level, I, I don't think so. It's that, you know, as, as Denise has said, it's, there are so many things that the Nigerian youth are dealing with. That investment in the Nigerian youth at this point is not as much as it was before. But I also want to look at another angle, hustle culture. We've talked about this decadence, the crime rates and all of that. And you look at, you know, this is where most of the work we're doing, especially with respect to SGBG, for example. I remember having a meeting with the DG of NTA himself on the role the government has to play with some of these things. NTA, National Film and Video Censors Board, NBC, the content that youths take in in this country is quite dangerous. From the music to the movies, in the, in the 90s, Nollywood, you would watch a movie where 90% of the movie shows them robbing people, doing rituals, being enriched by it. Then the last, in fact, the last 99%, then that 1% is when they will give their life to God and then they are relieved of all their sins. But for the entire movie, you watch these people enrich themselves on illegal things and spend. And so when we were watching then, I don't think that watching those movies, the deterrent was enough for me. The deterrent was 1% of the thing. movie. The rest of it showed me that if you robbed, if you stole, mm -hmm. if you got involved in ritual killings, this is how big you will live. And so people made that decision that, okay, if at the end of the day God does not forgive me, but at least I've lived big for some level of years. And then you put that with the difficulty people are living with. What we saw, the content we absorbed growing up showed us that if you did a life of crime, you would live a very wealthy life. If you go into music, the same hustle culture is pumped there. Our music, listen to it again. I want to make it. I want to, if I, if I catch the mugu, mm -hmm. if I, do, over and over and over again, everything the young person <coughs> is absorbing in Nigeria is pointing to make money one way or the other. And when you make money, be ostentatious with it. Spend it anyhow. So let's keep that one side, right? What we have absorbed from the media. And then we look at the society and what it tends to appreciate, what it tends to, what the Nigerian society tends to applaud. In Nigeria, the louder, the more ostentatious, that is the one in the village they will make a chief. That questions are not asked anymore. When we were growing up, it was the teacher. Not even, not when I was growing up, my mother's time, I would say. It was the teacher. When you say, who is the most respected person in the society? The, the, headmaster, the headmaster, the teacher. Those were the ones. But as things started changing, especially with 99, there was something that happened in 99. When we had a new democracy, I remember middle class people thought military will not go away. Let us wait first. And did not jump into politics. It was a certain kind of people that entered politics. And things just changed from there. We started seeing people come back with cars and things that we could not explain, that our parents took longer time to get. And society did not question. Society praised it. Are you wealthy? Come and get an applause. Are you wealthy? You get away with things. What you applaud, what you reward will continue to grow. And right now, Nigeria has shown us that people who put their heads down and do the work a certain way will not get rewarded. When you stop, police will not heal you. When you get to certain places, car doors will not be opened for you. The key thing is you have to have money. And that is the answer. Nigeria will not care whether you got the money the right way, the wrong way, nothing. You just have to have it. And young people are seeing these things over and over again. Now, I started this point on something, and I want to return it there. That there are several agencies, there are several institutions that are supposed to pay attention to these things in the kinds of messaging we receive, in the kinds of things that our minds are focused on. And even if it's just on that orientation, we can focus on. I see that. I think that change would happen. Thank you. Undi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a song that says something about, I want to be chairman, chairman. Have, have you heard that song? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've heard the song. Yes. I don't know who the artist is, but it don't tell you that you don't want to be a floor member, you want to be a chairman, because when you are a chairman, <laughs> that is when all the perks, all the perks get to you. We will return to the aspect of socialization that uh, we've, we've had, uh, which of course is supposed to be the responsibility of the older generation and how this has, as it were, misled or even misdirected uh, a number of young persons. Engineer uh, Mohammed Onotu, uh, let's get your own take on this. I mean, listening to uh, into this, he just let it bear. There's nothing that we can run away from. Everybody, uh, we are all suffering the consequences. Young kids that you see who are kidnappers, who are into banditry, those who are dropping out of school and getting into Yahoo Plus or Yahoo Yahoo, 
uh, they are all with us. Why are we this way? I tend to agree with everything everyone has said, but you know, I usually my own thinking pattern is usually different. You know, over the years, I've always believed, you know, one of the key components of any society is strong investment in personal growth and development of every individual. You know, because we always make emphasis on the problem, then we fail to realize in every problem, there must have been a reason. For instance, you see someone going into prostitution. It's easy to jump and say, oh, this person is, going, is doing something that is immoral. But go back and rewind the essence of the person going into prostitution in the first place is that you would find out that maybe this person is struggling to cater for the younger ones. So let me come back to the basic of the personal growth and development that I did mention in the, in the earlier stage of my conversation. You know, I'd always believed that if we as a people l reflect inwardly and not just be bothered about the problem, because now we're talking about the youth, there's a transition ongoing. There are people that in two years and three years, they come into the same pattern that we're talking about. So what is the solution? What is the way forward? So we need to now evaluate what effort are we making? It's not all about um, looking at means of engaging the youth, maybe hand, uh, hand the tools, how can they learn skills here and there? No, it's way beyond that. Because before you can really <coughs> thrive as an individual, you need to have a sense of identity. This sense of identity shapes who you, you become, your level of self-discipline, how you tend to process information. So what I think needs to be done is for us as individuals, as institutions, to look at it, how can we collaborate? How can we all come together and see how can we have a level of sense of identity? This sense of identity gives a level of clarity, clarity of purpose. Then these, at the end of the day, sharpens the way you are able to see, okay, should I follow this path? Should I not follow this path? It gives you that sense of being a human being. So it gives you the, the freedom, the freedom in the sense to be able not to be judgmental, not to be able to, to be sentimental in whatever decision you tend to take as an individual. So I think we have to come back and ask the question, what are we as an individual, as individuals and collectively as a group, what efforts are we making towards realizing that we need to consistently, I mean, I, I use the word consistently, to move to the part of personal growth and development because this would give us a level of clarity, this would give us a level of self-discipline in being able to uphold value system, either a cultural value system, either a moral value system, either a social value system, to be able to give us that level of progression, that level of transition, because every generation has a generation underneath watching you, significantly looking at the decisions you're taking, the choices you're making, and the pattern of living. So I, I don't know, I always tend to think differently, but I think collectively we all, we all are guilty of what we accuse of the, of, of the youth. Because one way or the other, directly or indirectly, we all have roles to play. It's easy to point fingers. It's easy to say, oh, this person is doing this wrong, this person is doing that which is not correct. But I think if we can have an educational system, if we can have an educational system that can look into the emotional development of individuals, that can look into the intellectual development of individuals, that can look into the spiritual development of individuals, that can also create a level of experiences to show that in every action, there is a consequence. If you do well, there is a reward system. If you do the other way, there can be correctional means of bringing you back to order, and there can also be a level of punishment. This, if we can all synergize, we would see that you know, the society will not only be morally conscious, a society would be vision driven, a society that would you know, find the little things relevant, things like integrity, things like kindness, things like compassion. You know, when you have all these components integrated into the formation of a human being, whoever you meet, it doesn't necessarily matter if the person this is, speaks the same language with you, it's irrelevant. What is relevant at that point is, I am dealing with a human being, and the human being comes, comes first before any other thing. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, and you know, not to mm. thank you very much uh, also for uh, your perspective. I mean, uh, in the uh, early stage of your intervention, you did say that you agreed with what all the other guests had said. 
uh, we're not going to end this conversation anyway without uh, proffering solutions on what uh, should be done uh, to uh, get some of our youth out of the challenges that we're having today. I mean, if you listen to the other guests again, uh, you have to first lay the problems uh, on the table uh, in, in paraphrase and just say, look, how did we get to where we are? So that when we are then proffering solutions, I think getting the solutions from you guys, uh, we know that those solutions are tied to the identification of uh, what the problems are and how they arose. I mean, the, the MB, for instance, was talking about socialization. Everybody who, 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 who watches uh, the, some of these uh, movies that you, you, you talk about, the kind of songs that you, that you listen to or the entertainment factor and so on and so forth, and the, 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 the uh, alteration, if you like, of our value system. It's been going on for some years, but it would appear to have exploded only in recent decades, and we are seeing what the youth are doing. In our time, when I was growing up, there was nothing like Yahoo, Yahoo. I mean, we didn't know what Yahoo. <laughs> the only song we knew then was by a band that was playing Yahoo. You know, so when you got to her, <laughs> eight to uh, the band. age of the Yahoo age, was, oh, this is what it's all about, and so, and so on and so forth. So mm. oh, we, we will come back to the solutions, but just for us to identify who has failed and how do we plug the gaps, uh, Claire? Uh, yes, wh who has failed and you know, how do we plug the gaps? I also want to ask uh, the former minister, because when you ask the youths, they they what, what you hear is that, oh, our voices are not heard, we've not been given the opportunity to express ourselves. Are we listening to the youths at all? No, we are speaking to ourselves. Um, you see, let us be open and frank. We are dealing with a crisis, and there is no need going around it. I always give people example with myself, what I went through, how I was brought up. The young people of today, where are we in Jojibo? Where? Which of the institutions now engage the young people. Let's take education, which is the major institution that is responsible for molding the mind and developing the mental development of a young person. The first institution is the school. The, from the family to the school. Now, the role the family plays <coughs> is now to complement whatever that is fed into by the educational um, institution. What is the content of our education? What is available there for the young people? Is it engaging? The answer is certainly no. Look at even the inequality in terms of access to education. At, the point, at that point, you will now realize that our educational system is fashioned in a way that prepares people for this crisis we are dealing with because of the inequality we have in access to education. Uh, when I was growing up, there was nothing called private school. I heard of mission school. Those mission schools were very far from us. All of us went to a common school. When I went to secondary school, government college, the entire nation were my classmates because my classmates were drawn from every state of the country. Those were the people I went to school with. And so I had the opportunity of engaging with the entire country at that young age. And we understood ourselves well. That was the educational system. It prepared us to be patriotic. It gave us the opportunity to know the country, to know the peoples of the country, to love ourselves. Today, the neighborhood will be a nursery school. Next tomorrow, it is a primary school. By the third day, it's a secondary school. It has no any sport facility. It has no parking space. It has nothing. The school, the children that went to that school only knew their neighborhood. They do not even know anybody next to. And then the next thing is, it's a secondary school. So they graduated from their father's house to a, neighbor, a next uh, a neighborhood, which is a school. And maybe 
privilege to go to a polytechnic which is five kilometers away. How do you expect such a person to fit into this federal arrangement of over 580 ethnic nationalities? His, his perspective of what Nigeria is narrowed down to the environment in which he grew up. So the educational institution is the first suspect and the content. Back to what she said. It is the collapse of the educational institution to deliver that the, you know, the agitative minds of the young people grab anything. So it now looks for what is appealing. They are victims. Young people are victims. So it begins to get to what is appealing. And more so that we have replaced the value system. Reward system has collapsed. When I was going over as a child and they sent to you, come back, the way our parents will appreciate you for going on an errand. I mean, you feel so proud that next time you aspire to be sent on an errand. That was a reward system that was developed even to the level of the society. Today, where is our reward system? That's what she's interrogating. Is the collapse of the reward system that led into people doing what they are doing. We endorsed, we endorsed negative things and fight positive things. If you express an opinion in this country against what is going wrong, the society will frown at you. If you say, oh, my neighbor, I don't know what he's doing, but he came back with a jeep last night, the society will say, what's your business? So our value system now also <coughs> has collapsed. Therefore, we are not engaging the youth from the family up to the larger society. In politics, they have no space. At home, they have no space. Uh, and, and so they now decide, so, okay, what we see is what we do. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Undi, I, I want to ret return to you. Uh, the comment made by uh, Solomon Dalong with regard to the fact that we, we are, do not appear to be communicating with our youth. Uh, and if we are communicating, we don't appear to be communicating effectively. Communicating being a two-way uh, process. You know, we're speaking to them and they're speaking to us. We're hearing them and then responding uh, to, to their yearnings. Are we so far apart now that uh, it might be a challenge to seek to bridge the communication gap and then uh, deal with the challenges that we see right in front of us? I, I think so. I, I think that as people grow older, they, they forget that there's, they too have some youth in them, that they were once in a place, and it's just age and time that brings you. Yeah. And so when most times when, we are, when we're talking with people who are much older, there's a dismissive nature to the conversation. Those small people there, you know, they are just crazy young people there, <laughs> watching Big Brother there, you know. And everything we engage in, that is not necessarily immoral or, you know, negative, is also looked down on. But the key to things like this is actually on engaging people on their level there mm. and talking to them on that level and looking at what is the thing that interests these people now and trying to engage there and trying to listen to what they have to say. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if you actually go on social media, go into all these spaces where you see this level of decadence that young people are, uh, you know, pushing out, there's a central thing, there's a silent message in it Hustle culture is not hustle culture for the sake of it. It's grabbing at anything to survive. And that's, I think we That's hustle culture. Yes, Nigeria has hustle culture. We don't have <laughs> excellence. that my, my table that I make will be different. No, I, have, I want to be a carpenter. And in two months' time, I will make this number of tables that will bring me this kind of money. And let me see how many tables I can bring out. It's hustle culture. It's survival culture. Let me just, you know. And I think we need to listen. Listen to that thing that people are trying to survive in Nigeria, at the bottom of it all. People are trying to survive. And then by the time they survive, survival in Nigeria is not just being able to eat every day. Survival is being your own government and having enough 
that the system cannot oppress you. And I think that is what we need to listen to. We need to hear that. You clear. I'm listening to Ndi now. You hear what she said, and I'm sure our viewers are also listening, that there's a hustle culture. Grab what you can so that the society doesn't oppress you. No. This hustle culture. You, a government of government. So you have a government very of your own. Important. Yeah, that's very important. No, you have government of yourself. Precisely. <laughs> and and the, 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 the elders have been the ones who have been running their own personal government. government. They call it local government. <laughs> have your own borough, have your own yes. security guard, have your I own guard, everything. But I'm just wondering, when we are talking about this, uh, does it also permeate those who are supposed to be guardians of of, of our society. Law enforcement agents, some of them are in the youth category. Do they also have this hustle culture? Does this impact uh, law and order? Does it impact the, the, the general, uh, uh, let me not say general so that that's not too uh, stupid statement. a statement. I was going to say the general anomaly that you find all over the place that, uh, I, I don't know, that, that's, that's just, you, you understand the, the question yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. Of course it does, you know, he, he um, I, I remember, I, I, remember a, I have a, a childhood classmate who is, is in customs right now, and every time he talks, I don't hear the conversation around, forgive me, please, or don't, I don't know, I'm sure you can see this. Um, every time he talks, I don't see him talking about what is happening at the courts and how we can improve. I hear him talking about oppression. If police stop me for road like this, like this, like if I, if I catch somebody, my koboko is at the back of the car, you know, I can, these things are there. These things are there. So it's not like it's, and you know, um, His Excellency made mention of a time he actually um, uh, suggested somebody for a role, referred somebody for a role. Luckily, that security agency took the time. But these days, a lot of the time, you don't, they don't take the time. And it's the same thing that we are carrying in there. We're not trying to be the best policeman. We're trying to enter police for hustle culture. I will become IG of police one day. Uh, if you have you heard a young person talking about working in the civil service? How many times do you hear a Nigerian say, I am going to enter the Ministry of Agriculture because I believe in agri, and I want to bring changes to the ministry. And then when I bring changes to the ministry, this is what will happen. No, instead what we hear is, when I become director, that's straight up. If I spend three, four, five years, I'll do promotion exam, do promotion exam. When I become director, these are the things that would come to me. There is no, no iota of excellence in the Nigerian system. I'm, I'm quite sorry I have to say this on NTA, but there is no iota. We don't promote it. People get promoted, and, and this is also, let's look at even our elders. Our elders get promoted at work, come and do Thanksgiving at church. We don't hear them talk about, wow, I have been waiting to get this position so that I can implement something. No, we hear Finally, the Lord has done. What has the Lord, what has the Lord done? <laughs> what has the Lord done? Do and then the pastor goes, in this church, once you attend this church, everything will be looking rosy for you. What is the rosy? It's government coffers. Everybody has accepted that this is what it is. It's a problem that we have seen from the church. And, you know, your generation got a certain level of excellence given to you by the system. And unfortunately for us, after enjoying that excellence, what needed to happen, we were still having population explosion. Yes. We're having all of these things. If you enjoyed free education in school, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to ensure that free education continues on a larger scale. It flows. That it gets even better. That it flows. But you enjoy free education and you watched it decay under your watch. So right now, my gen I even did public school. Children of upper civil servants and the rest. My own children cannot do public school. Now she's saying that gap is going, you, before you attend school, I attended gifted with children of ministers, vice presidents, governors, everybody, we're all there eating from uh, gifted guagualada. Now you cannot say that. We would rather go to regents. So what is happening to those children going to gifted? Those are the ones that are waiting for us. Less and less people, because of the poverty line, can attend these other bigger schools. So we attend, we form our small clusters. More and more people are going towards the poverty that we, let's take responsibility. We are building the decadence that we are building. And what we are seeing is the result. Now we can't see the results and go, okay, why is this happening? It's strange. It's not strange. We have invested heavily in a decadent society mm. and we'll reap the results. That's, that's very unfortunate. I, 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 I know this is a matter that really bothers uh, you know, uh, uh, deeply around the youth. 
and that's why we, are, we seem to be having more contribution coming from Indy and, uh, and the engineer Onuto here. But let's return to Jos and hear uh, from uh, Victor Lapang. And I if, if you uh, listen to what Indy just said a moment ago, um, there's a point that directs my mind to the spirituality of the Yoruba. And if you look at some of the provisions in both Islam and Quran, it extols the you know, um, high value, vibrancy and strength you know, that, that the youth, uh, youthful age you know, portends uh, or, or, or has against their other ages. But despite that, we've not seen you know, much in terms of development, in terms of contribution coming from the youth. Is there a spirituality side to it that needs to be balanced? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I had actually thought I was forgotten here in Joss. Uh, the conversation is getting more and more interesting. Uh, spirituality, yes, I would say a little, but uh, the crux of the matter is, is uh, socialization, as was said earlier on. Uh, lack of that moral compass. When anybody is growing up, the first thing you, the, the, the first unit of, uh, of, of, of meeting is in the family unit. If you do not have uh, uh, a moral upbringing, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't, uh, it, will, it, it, it will reflect on the society at large. That's one. And uh, I spoke about generational problems from one generation to the other. Okay, let's look at the generation we, we are in now, right? The first issue with this generation is that in 1991, as someone rightly pointed out, a lot of people didn't go into politics. Uh, I know that because mm, I'm a victim of this generation. I could say uh, I spent over 10 years in the university. After that, I couldn't get a job from where I I, I uh, moved into politics. I was a member of the State House of Assembly in uh, 2003. And I was, I was just, uh, I, I had just turned 30 years. And at that time, a lot was coming in. The uh, uh, social media had just started coming in. It, the, uh, the internet had just started coming in. I think uh, right now we are victims of our own creation. Because if you look at the young people nowadays, uh, I would say they're, they're a very smart group. They're a very intelligent group. In fact, I would say that sometimes they know more than we know. When I, when I talk to my children from time to time, when I talk to them, it's, it's all about information overload. They have so much, and to process all that, with their little ages, it's quite hard. So they, they tend to know so much. And what, what, is every, what, what, is the, what is everything all about now? It's about get rich quick, be the star in my own generation. And uh, the issues of like giving back to society is not as it used to be before. Uh, we talk about getting political offices, just sitting back and uh, doing thanksgiving, thanking the Lord without really having recourse to looking at your moral compass, what, 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 is, uh, what your moral compass will tell you to do that would benefit the uh, society. So uh, I think spiri spiritually, uh, spirituality has been used as a tool for, for uh, political domination, for ethnic, et ethnic domination now. So we need a total reorientation of uh, our, our perception of, uh, uh, of our nation, we need to sit down and, and really look at how we can move forward. Uh, let me give you a small example. During the uh, NSAS riots, I, I, I was opportune to sit down with some really uh, intelligent Nigerians. And what I noticed in Jaws was that most of them had came from out of Jaws to participate in this riot in Jaws. So what I told them was, uh, look, strike while the ovation is loudest so that you would, uh, you would be listened to. What most of them told me was that one, they didn't have leaders. 
two, they felt that till there are other branches in Abuja and Lagos made decisions before they made decisions. So unfortunately, the protest fizzled out. I, I have kept in contact with them and the advice I've been giving them is this, look, what you need to do now is to make sure you participate in the political process. Unfortunately, from what I'm seeing, most of them are not participating in that political process. They sit down as armchair critics, criticize the system, and are not bringing any value to that system. So I think what happens, uh, back to your question, on the issue of uh, religion, uh, Karl Marx once said uh, religion is the opium of the masses. And I, I think it's true. Religion is used as a tool of suppression, of oppression within our own systems now. So, so I, I think uh, the religious leaders really need to have uh, a rethink and let's forget about all these uh, prosperity issues. Let's go back, put our, uh, bring our moral, uh, set our moral compass well, and I, at least we can move forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Lapang, there for your comments. Uh, we will not uh, uh, forget you again, and we will return to you uh, in the course of the conversation. Now, back to Engineer Onoto. Engineer Onoto, when they talk about the hustle culture, now uh, that's the uh, probably the labor for it uh, for this generation. Mm -hmm. uh, we also know about the rat race. Uh, in our time, it was called the rat race, uh, and I think Bob Marley also. Uh, had a song yeah, about that, yeah, something about yeah. about rat race, uh, everybody hustling and trying to make it. But what was underlining uh, that rat race had to do with excellence. It had to do with the drive and push uh, for accomplishment. I mean, I uh, I'm just I'm just remembering now as teenagers, it, 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 you also had loafers. You also had loafers in the never do wells. Uh, a few bad boys, you know, were smoking. Oh, oh yes, who were smoking Indian <laughs> hemp? We call them NFAs. <laughs> NFA meant no future ambition. Yeah. Uh, no future ambition. Because of the future ambition, you you had to go to school. Uh, you had to work and work hard and be honest. So, but we are seeing a, a broader ramification now in the hustle culture. Uh, again, once you tick off the various bad things that you see amongst uh, some of our youth, and then you measure that against some of the excellent things that some of the young persons are also doing. ICT, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, where some of these young persons you know, are, 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 are uh, making uh, uh, huge gains and a huge contribution to society. Uh, 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 and, uh, well, aspects of entertainment uh, as well. But uh, how can we uh, extricate the, if you like, uh, decadent aspects of the hustle culture and you want to ride a jeep, and then, so you, you ride a jeep, so what? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very good um, observation and a good question. So it's now a divide between legacy and survival. So it, there is nothing wrong when you have aspirations of having them um, enjoying the good life. It's, it, we're humans and we tend to have this level of um, attraction to good things. So from the question you did ask, you know, it's a divide between Am I living for a good legacy or am I just living to survive? So you can still be in the hustle culture with the mindset of having a strong leg legacy behind. I remember when I was still, I grew up on Ireland, so I had tons of friends that were smoking weed. We'll see it, we'll chat, but I'd never, I wouldn't credit that to righteousness. I would credit that to grace and also to clarity of purpose. You know, all I had always wanted was I could die anytime. So what legacy would I leave behind? So, but at, the, at that moment, I, I would also, I also have aspirations of enjoying the good life. You know, my friends will go to party, they will go to clubs and all that, we're still friends, you know, but I learn from them. You know, I, I think um, I, there's this friend of mine, he was among the, the craziest in court, you know, but every time I sit down with him, I always see the goodness in him. You know, there's this level of goodness, even though he smokes, he does all this, you know, that shows that all he needed at that point, you know, was to be able to be able to differentiate between am I just living because of the situation surround, I'm surrounded with that could have actually pushed me into smoking of weed. Can I do better? Can I live a more meaningful life? So 
at that point, all I could only see is that my friend was only just living to survive, you know, based on also where he was coming from. There was a huge level of pressure. You could say at that point that he was depressed to a large extent. But I was seeing beyond what he was seeing. I was looking at it that you have a good heart. Why can't you just look at this tiny fragment in you, you see, and channel this energy, which we could also call the hustle energy, you know. And at the same time, you could also see someone else still hustling. Hustling is not something negative. You know, you could hustle towards the part of your aspiration. You could hustle towards the part of just enjoying the worldly life. So what sometimes when you're in the hustle culture with the negative mindset is that you look at it that, oh, I just have to find the shortest means of achieving this. But if you're in the hustle culture with a positive mindset, you're looking at it, okay, this process can take me four years, it can take me five years, but I have something, I have a target. It might take me time, but what I'm looking at is something worthwhile, something of great value, something of great substance. So on that level, you're hustling with a positive <laughs> mindset. But where it goes wrong is when you're hustling with a negative mindset. You're hustling because you want to get more money, you want to get more fame, you want to, you know, everything goes on and on and on and on. And the amazing thing about life is that life is like an illusion. You know, like someone that is thirsty, you're in a desert, you're driving, you're seeing a mirage. In your mind, you're looking at it, oh, I'm getting close to a water supply, I'm getting close, I'm getting close. So when you're in the hustle with the negative mindset, this is how it goes. You're looking at it, I'm getting close to the water, you're getting close, you know, you're having that level of, you know, happiness, that level of feel that, oh, very soon my test will be over. You get to the end of the road, you just realize it's a mirage. There is no water at all. So when you hustle in the negative mindset, you hustle with this at the end of the, at the, end of the tunnel, you see that there's nothing really worth it. So, but when you hustle with the positive mindset, you know that regardless of how long it takes you, you're living a life of substance, you're living a life of meaning. So this is where the youth needs to be able to differentiate. Am I hustling with the negative mindset or am I hustling with the positive mindset? What legacy do I want to leave behind? Or do I just want to live to survive? If you live to survive, you can be forgotten in the next 24 okay. hours. <laughs> and and you know, to thank you. I, I think this is a fundamental question that Kingsley asked uh, that must go around. How do we extricate the decadence from that hustle culture? Because it's, it's, it permeates every action that the youth do. You know, do. We'll do that. All right, welcome back. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria. And just before we went on break, I did say that uh, qu the question Kingsley raised is very fundamental and it will have to go round. So I'm starting with uh, Injikato. How can we extricate the decadence in that hustle culture? So, you know, the first thing I did was speak to socialization. And I'll bring it back again to you all. NTA, NBC, National Film. I always have it outlined because every time I think about Nigeria, I think about the roles these organizations have to play. We need to edit the content Nigerians receive daily. We need to lead the way, even down to journalists. If you look at the reporting, I remember there was a time it looked like journalists were proud to go and cover what bandits were doing. Did you, did you see that time? I traveled to the hinterlands of Katina to meet with the biggest of the bandits. He controls, I'm like, this sounds like praise singing at some point. We need to look at our content and what Nigerians absorb. We need to look at that. Then we need to look at the justice system. A society that, does, that, that promotes injustice as heavily as Nigeria promotes injustice, as Nigeria dwells in and engages injustice, is bound to end like this, where people constitute the law unto themselves. Earlier when I talked about how we are, we are our own <coughs> government, we provide everything for ourselves. By the time you do that, you're not <coughs> looking at the constitution of your country or the moral fabric of your country to, you know, these are the things that are supposed to control how you behave. We don't have that. Now, if a justice system does not punish good, and uh, punish bad or reward good, people will do as they will. In fact, humans, we should not tend to look at ourselves as if we are some higher, no. It's socialization, it's what, we, what, it's what we are conditioned to do that we end up doing. And right now, Nigeria is conditioning us towards that. And we need to look at those things. Now let's go back to the religious system. You spoke of religiosity and I want to touch on it a bit. I think even our religious uh, leaders have lost the plot, completely. And so you see a lot of young people have lost, re religiosity is now out of many people are coming out that they do not believe anymore. You go to church and the, the message you seek to hear is not there. 
you know, I'm not going to church because I want to make it. I want to hear something that calms my spirit, that shows me the way forward. And you go and you actually hear actual bad messages. You have to listen to our pastors, our imams, and the way they speak. And these are the gatekeepers. You've, you are in mass comms, so you know what the gatekeeper theory is. The gatekeepers of, com of society for Nigeria are getting it wrong. And we need to interrogate that. Our pastors, imams, other religious leaders, our community leaders, all of these things. Another thing that shreds the very fabric of society when you talk of community leaders. Before, our community leaders were, again, the people who showed the most moral standing <coughs> in, com in, in the society. Or came from a, or, uh, from a history of this was the king and his son was the king and his son. And we expected that this family, this is the way they behave. This is, we hold them to a higher standard. Today, somebody who rigged the election, who came in from the back door into election, determines who is the king of a place. And they can just bring the worst person and make them lord over people. So for me, all of these things, I, I believe we're talking about solutions mm -hmm. now. We need to look at it from this angle. Look, we need to censor. And sen I'm not saying, look, take away the right of people to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to speak their mind. But censorship, any sane society, let me, <laughs> censorship can even come as an incentive. In, in Ghana, the president of Ghana, um, uh, uh, His Excellency Nana Akufo-Addo, put $25 million on the table for movie industry in Ghana, Ghanaian movie industry, and said, look, you have access to this money for your movies, but your movies must do certain things. It must show Ghana in a good light. Mm. That's number one. And number two, it must present the Ghanaian as a better person. It must show the society in a certain light. It must make people aspire to good. I think we need to start putting these things at the table. What is my final take? That look, we must put incentives for good at every stop. The same way, let's use the analogy of is it Alewa, the milk, the milk um, um, yes, sweet he talked about mm -hmm. that made him go to school. We <coughs> must drop it at every step of the way for Nigerian, Nigerians. If you go, do good, look at your milk biscuits. If you behave this way, look at your milk biscuits. And the next step, look at your milk biscuits. And then this step, look at your milk biscuits. We must keep dropping the milk biscuits along the line for good behavior for Nigerians every step of the way. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to start writing my biography on air, but some of the incentives you talked about now, we all had them as young persons <laughs> when we were in school. Uh, one of our teachers is late now, Mr. Morigue, was our teacher in primary six. He would uh, conduct current affairs impromptu in class. Impromptu current affairs. Yeah. Uh, it, would ask, it, would, it could be the leaders, name the leaders of certain African countries. You had Malawi, Kamuz, Uganda. Uh, and so on and so forth, leaders around the world. And from his pocket, it would go, you know, there was this malted biscuit. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's in the market anymore, so it's, there's no advertisement for this. If you got certain questions, you will have your own malted biscuit. And then there was this Nico sweet. You yeah. know, there was the <laughs> green one. <laughs> that was like pineapple, <laughs> which, was my, which was my favorite. Uh, so you had, you had those things. Uh, and uh, I mean, you grew up to, Absorb some of those things. And the thanks a lot. To go into school. What, what, what are you saying? <laughs> 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 In fact, it was that teacher that took us to the studios for the first time. Uh, uh, the uh, former minister of, of youth and, and, uh, and sport. And sport. <coughs> Still on this trajectory of what we are discussing, the point was made earlier that for us to get out of this crisis, as you described it, we have to get down to the level of the youth, to speak to them, to bring them up, to say, look, these are the proper values. Live for a legacy, not live for a survival. Even the survival of the fittest, you get crushed easily, and then you get forgotten. Uh, can we push ourselves uh, to try to do some of these things now? To say, wait a minute, we are, we, we are, we are diverting off course. It is like a ship that is getting off course and of course gets lost in, on the high seas. Can we push ourselves to that now to say, oh, listen, this thing is not going to, uh, it's not going to be okay for us. In our old age, we'll most likely suffer. You see, every society must organize itself towards its own civilization. Um, societies have gone into different crises, but when they realize they draw the curtain to bad history and chart a new course. Now, there must be a consensus among us leaders 
that we have a crisis. It is that consensus that is going to now trigger the question of development. We have a crisis with our youth and their integration. I don't blame the young people. I don't. They are just victims. They are victims of the crisis created by our generation. Because we had it and we cannot explain why we cannot get back. So all this rigmaroling and trying to blame the young people is just to uh, sort of free ourselves from the blameworthiness of not doing what was right at the right time. We have to now say, okay. <clears throat> she pointed at a particular stage where this thing started generating. And she got it right. From 1999. We now said, okay, we have agreed that we have a youth crisis. What do we do? We have to now go to the engine house of knowledge, which is education. What type of education do we want to give our children the content and what type of civilization do we aspire? We, we tackle that first. Then cut the tape between the two generations. The upcoming one built a foundation of the new vision we have in them and invest heavily. And then what do we do with this crisis generation? We now have to ad address them, engage them, talk to them. Because the young people, like we said, are very smart. If you engage the young people, gather them, even they are Yahoo, they are bandits, they are kidnappers, they are ritualists, gather them and talk to them. You will be ashamed of yourself. You will be ashamed of yourself. I challenge us, the leaders of this country and the government of Nigeria, let us invite these young people, whether they are ritualists, whether they are Yahoo, whether they are prostitutes, to a national conversation and listen to what they will say. Okay, uh, former minister, thank you. Let's quickly take the response from Mr. Lapang in just a few, few maybe about um, 60 seconds or so. Uh, is the situation redeemable? And if so, how quickly and effectively can we begin to do that? Uh, it is very redeemable. I'll give you an example of what we are doing in Plateau State. Uh, we have a youth council. We call it the Plateau State Youth Council. This government uh, brought it back after ab uh, from being about after about seven years of uh, court cases within the youths, and uh, it's it's uh, it's an organization that goes right. Uh, the way all the way to the grassroots. We have the state level, we have the uh, local government level, we have the district level, and we have a feedback mechanism from that. And uh, secondly, I think we should bring more young people in, into the government. If you look at the critical uh, sectors in Plateau State, it's manned by uh, young people from uh, the ICT development agency, uh, the health, uh, the contributory health scheme, uh, Plasmida, uh, Plasmida, which is the uh, Small and Medium uh, Enterprises Development Agency. It's all manned by young people. And these young people should know that they have a responsibility to bring people, to bring uh, their own peers and people like them into uh, government. Uh, I don't, it's really redeemable, I think, because if you look at the set of 1999, the, uh, our governors then, these were young people in their 30s. And as they grew, you wouldn't blame them because the people they stayed in government with and had some trust in, when they moved to other positions, they moved with those people. So it's a, I, I've, all, I've said it, it's a generation thing. And uh, we have to look inwards. If we look inwards, we, uh, we, we, there has to be a deliberate effort from us. You know what you want, you know what's good for you. And uh, with the right leadership, I think we will, we will get better. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Victor Lapang. Back to engineer. Uh, Onotu, your, your closing thoughts on, on this subject matter. How do we more effectively, in addition to the suggestions that have been made, uh, win off our uh, youth from the decadent aspects of the hustle culture and then win their hearts and minds 
to live it for a legacy? I think um, one thing we should also look at is, regardless of the, the, the religious divide, we should know that God will not change our condition until we change what is in ourselves. Because God has actually given us this freedom, you know, to be able to choose between what is good and what is bad. That is why we have the intellect. So I think um, we need to evaluate our approach in the engagement of the youths. And also, most importantly, we need to evaluate and restructure our educational system. So before, the first component that needs to come in into the educational system is the character development of the individual, even before going into the academics. Mm -hmm. So this gives a more sense of clarity on why you are doing what you're doing. And it also gives this sense of responsibility. So we need to engage, find the right approach in engaging the youth that can enhance their level of self-actualization and also productivity. And also we need to also look at a way of restructuring our educational system so that the early stage of the educational system can be committed into the character development of the child. Then going forward, the academic aspect can now follow. So this gives a level of clarity to the child and also the society can be rest assured that the, the child can be able to distinguish between what is good and what is right and also be able to have that level of sense of responsibility in treating any human being, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of religion, in the appropriate way. Okay, Angela Noto, thank you. Uh, Mbikato, 60 seconds. Um, I'll say that all of us need to focus on where Nigeria is going. And I think I'll use, I'll broaden the word youth here and say it's everyone in Nigeria. There is a Nigerian problem. It's a Nigerian problem that we need to address. Um, the socialization of the Nigerian going forward, we need to look inward. He has said it, that societies build their own civilization, create the kind of society they want to see. And we can't leave it for any other person, it's us. Right now, outside the country, the disrespect is too much. Everybody, xenophobia is growing. The arguments we have against xenophobia are not strong enough because of what people are bringing back to us as what they think Nigerians are. We need to work on ourselves. We need to work on this system. We need to ensure that our behavior collectively changes. And this is the only way forward. Thank you. All right, Ndi Kato, uh, um, I must thank you indeed uh, for all your contribution. Ndi Kato is executive director, uh, Dinidari Foundation. It's a pleasure to uh, have you on this show. Let me also appreciate Engineer Mohamed Onotu. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution as well. Uh, your founder, Productive Youth Network, and Reach to Rise Nigeria Limited, author of The Future Starts Today and What I Will Do if unemployed. And Jenny Noto, many thanks to you. Thank you very and, much. And uh, let me also appreciate the Commissioner for Youth and Sports, uh, who, uh, Plateau State, who joined us from our job studio, uh, Mr. Victor Lapang. Mr. Lapang, thank you very much for joining us. And we wish you a pleasant day. And finally, the former Minister of uh, uh, Youth and Sports, uh, Mr. Solomon Gabon, who also joined us here. Thank you very much, sir, for your contribution. And um, that's uh, uh, our conversation, but let's go, go on to sports now. And reigning champions, Algeria, dumped out of Afcon 20.